I'm claiming fair use for the images, film and music clips used in this video. Each one is necessary to add background to the product. I acknowledge that all rights belong to the copyright holders. I would strongly emphasise that you support creators of this art and purchase the DVDs, Blu-rays, CDs or downloads of films and media included in this documentary wherever possible. I encourage particular support to the synthwave artists, most of whom can be found on Bandcamp.com and to the creators of the documentary The Rise of the Synths, which can be bought from the link in the description. Since the synthwave genre of music is closely aligned to 80s action and horror movies, there may be some imagery and language included which could offend some of the more sensitive viewers. There you go, enough of the warnings, let's dive right in. As I'm sure it's become abundantly clear to anyone who's followed this review series, I have a huge soft spot for the 1980s. It's pure unashamed nostalgia, as it was the first full decade that I grew up in. And I'm still influenced by the films, TV, toys and music to this day. I'm not alone either. Shows like Stranger Things, Cobra Kai and American Horror Story, along with films such as Turbo Kid, It and The Summer of 84 have drawn inspiration from the decade in both the looks and the music. Since 2000, there's been a growing underground music scene, dubbed Synthwave, which started in the days of MySpace, a precursor to Facebook for all you young'uns out there. Synthwave is a genre of electronic music, inspired by the epic soundtracks of 1980s action and horror movies, along with computer game soundtracks. It's... Hang on a minute, I can't do this review. Not like this. Something's missing. Aha! There we go. That's much better. In this episode, I'm looking at the genre, along with a fantastic documentary which examines the history, the music, the influences that it built on, and the contributing artists from all over the world, called The Rise of the Synths, the documentary about synthwave music. <laughs> My taste in music has always veered towards the synthesised and technological. I'm still enamoured with 70s and 80s oddball bands such as Devo, Oingo Boingo, The Buggles and Sparks, all of whom created full albums in the 80s based around the synthesizer. In addition to them, I also enjoy artists such as Mike Oldfield, Jean-Michel Jarre and Van Gallus, who have all utilised synthesizers to create wonderful epic soundscapes. However, the earliest seeds of my interest in this type of music were sown by John Carpenter in the film Big Trouble in Little China when I was nine. It was the music in this particular scene that stuck with me. The score absolutely sold the drama and urgency of the situation. Plus, Kurt Russell was so cool throwing them both out of the way of the speeding car at the last second. I'm not the only one who felt this way, and John Carpenter is lauded as the originator of synthwave music, due to his iconic Halloween theme tune. also appears in the film as both interviewee and narrator. That's just great. Thinking back on it, an earlier occurrence for my love of synth-based music came from Jerry Goldsmith's theme from the 1984 horror comedy film Gremlins. I can't stress how much I was obsessed with that piece of music as a kid. Both scores stayed with me for many years, and surely influenced my appreciation for fast-paced, bouncy, quirky synthesizer tracks. 
So, I grew up with the synthesizer providing the background scores to my favourite films and TV shows. I developed a taste for dance and electronic music, but found myself gravitating back to the bands that I mentioned at the start of the video. When I discovered Synthwave, it became my default genre. There was so much to appreciate and discover, and then, one day, word emerged that there were plans for a Synthwave documentary. It was around 2016 when the documentary first appeared on Kickstarter. It described itself as a documentary about the synthwave scene, 80s nostalgia and Carpenter, Maroda and Tangerine Dream legacy. Unfortunately, it failed to reach its target goal and subsequently moved over to Indiegogo, another crowdfunding platform. This time, it hit its target. And the definitive Synthwave documentary looked like it was a goer. I'd backed it and pledged for the DVD, soundtrack and special collectible cassette. To this day, I'm still waiting on the cassette. However, I got the soundtrack album and the DVD, which were the most important elements. How did this end up on my radar, though? My interest in Synthwave began in 2013, when I first experienced it through the horror film, The ABCs of Death. This film worked on the gimmick of aligning a death scenario with one of the letters of the alphabet. Like most anthology films, there were some good shorts and some bad. It was the segment called Why is for Young Book, directed by Jason Eisner, that first introduced me to Synthwave. It was a disturbing short, but very, very well made. And it was the soundtrack that really grabbed my attention. It was a tune called Vengeance by a group called Power Glove. And reminded me of a 1980s soundtrack, but with a touch more techno. After watching that, I searched out the track on YouTube and ended up following links to similar artists. This caused me to fall down a rabbit hole. There were so many artists to discover making this sort of music. I was instantly hooked. I've enjoyed a great deal of what I heard, but I've become a big fan of bands such as Dance With The Dead, Carpenter Brute, Scandroid and Gunship amongst many others, all of whom were interviewed in this documentary. This was a genre of music that really resonated with me, and the artists making this music. It played on the nostalgia for the 1980s, when movies could be that little bit more experimental and creative, but also rather heartfelt and sincere. You've only got to look at the videos for Dark All Day, And when you grow up, your heart dies by gunship to see how influential the films of the 80s were to the group. In fact, the title, 
When You Grow Up, Your Heart Dies, is taken directly from the John Hughes film The Breakfast Club. When you grow up, your heart dies. Who cares? I care. The target date for the documentary release was December 2016. And this date came and went, and with no sign of the DVDs. However, we stayed positive thanks to constant updates from the documentary creators. There was talk of entering it into film festivals, or arranging deals for distribution before us backers could receive copies. This was fine, as we didn't want it leaking out until the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. We were eventually told that we'd receive it in 2018. Unfortunately, it missed its 2018 delivery date for backers as well. And there appeared to be some acrimony between the filmmakers and a featured artist. There were murmurings of discontent as well from some backers who said that it was a scam and that we'd never get the finished documentary. The naysayers were wrong when the DVD popped through our letterboxes in 2019 and I personally found it well worth the wait. The framing device is that of a time traveller from an apocalyptic future visiting the current day and age to check up on Disciples of the Master. Or something like that. The Disciples of the Master are all of the synthwave artists inspired by the legacy of John Carpenter. Mr Carpenter, director of such films as Halloween, The Thing, Assault on Precinct 13, The Fog, and Big Trouble in Little China, is as well known for his soundtracks as he is for his films. He has since had a renaissance as a synth artist. His albums, Lost Themes, have been very well received, and their popularity boosted with live tours from Carpenter. I highly recommend checking them out. He is a very brief taster. on a narrator role throughout the documentary, discussing the financial and timing necessities of scoring his own films, along with his views on the artistic sensibilities of the synthwave creators. He's engaging, positive, and provides an interesting viewpoint about being an outsider, working within the mainstream, creating art. The documentary interviews artists from France, England, America, Sweden and Canada about their influences and ethos. From its beginnings, Synthwave has been more about the music than the artist. The iconography of the genre consists of nighttime backgrounds, neon colours or glowing grid patterns. Several artists in the documentary were filmed either in the darkness or with the faces obscured, so as to preserve their anonymity. I, I'm not the thing that sells it, the music is. Do you know what I mean? And that's probably why we never put a face to it, because we didn't feel we need to jump up and down on top of the pops. Several artists expressed annoyance when fans of their earlier work turn against them for attempting something different and breaking out of the narrow confines of what they consider synthwave. When I did have Facebook, a fan made it and made me admin. So I start using it, I post a couple of tracks and I get comments like, this isn't an 80s Stallone track. And I'm thinking, well, I fucking made it, you know? So there's no interest, you know? The music's more interesting. That's, it always comes back to that. I noticed this recently with the French artist 
Carpenter Bruce. His track Turbo Killer from the Trilogy album marked him out as a key synthwave artist. However, there were several people complaining about his most recent track, entitled Fab Tool, claiming it strayed too far from its synthwave roots. Whether it does or doesn't is no concern to me. I really like it and I hope that we get an album featuring tracks of a similar calibre later on this year. Almost all of the artists admit that their work was heavily influenced by film scores and experimental artists from the 80s, even if some of them weren't even born in the decade themselves. Another example of my attraction to synth-based music came from the 1985 action-adventure series Street Hawk. The theme tune is a track called Le Parc, LA Street Hawk, by the group Tangerine Dream, and grabbed my attention at the time. In fact, I'd probably go so far as to say that I watched it more for the theme song than I did for the actual show. I had no idea at the time who Tangerine Dream were, well I was only 7 years old, so it just remained a cool theme tune until I discovered the origins of it many years later. The documentary touches on how unpopular synthesizer based music became towards the end of the 1980s. This led to the resurgence of guitar based bands and the creation of grunge in the 1990s. One artist even suggests that the synthwave iconography is more closely aligned to the 16-bit colour graphics of the 1990s than the 8-bit colour graphics of the 80s. I don't know though, glow and neon just feels so much more 1980s. Synthwave music is closely aligned to the sci-fi and horror genres of the 1980s. The band, Gunship, describe how their songs are constructed by using film scores as a touchstone. The language that we share in the studio is almost never bands. It's like, put a bit more Goonies in, put a bit more Terminator in. It's all visual, isn't it? That's the language that we use, and I haven't even realised that until now. Carpenter Brute and the artist Perturbator both draw influence from the 70s and 80s horror movies that used synthesizers to build up the scares. Claudio Simonetti's Goblin possibly best known for their score of 1978's Dawn of the Dead, is cited as a reference point. Whilst not mentioned, I find it hard to believe that the soundtrack to A Nightmare on Elm Street by Charles Bernstein wouldn't have been considered an influence. Both Carpenter Brute and Perturbator incorporate horror elements into their artwork. This gives it a feel of those dreaded satanic rock albums of the 1980s. Carpenter Brute's tracks have titles like Disco Zombie Italia, Sex Killer on the Loose. (music) 
and LA Venice Bitch ACs. These evoke the sordid Euro horror exploitation films of both the 70s and 80s. The band Dance with the Dead also draw their influence from horror movies. They in fact did cover the Nightmare on Elm Street theme. <music> Along with Gremlins. However, their imagery isn't so much skulls and pentagrams as monsters and zombies. And they were the first of the synthwave groups that I noticed that incorporated a more metal sound into their tracks. Even Scandroid got in on the horror act with his cover of Michael Jackson's Thriller. Cause this is Thriller, Thriller night, and no one's gonna save you from the beast about to strike. You know it's Thriller, Thriller night, you're fighting for your life inside a killer, Thriller Peter Beta mentions in the documentary that he grew up listening to hard metal, had been in a metal band, and found that the best way for him to make music was to just go it alone. The band Gunship also mentions that heavy metal and being in a metal band was an influence for them too. They say that, you know, heavy metal is a magnet for people that are basically unsatisfied with the status quo. And Synthwave is kind of similar. It's people that have kind of abandoned uh, the simplicity and limitations of pop music and are going for something more emotional, more atmospheric. Towards the end of the documentary, the influence of synthesizer luminaries such as Giorgio Moroder, Wendy Carlos and Van Gallus is acknowledged. All of whom created beautiful music and elevated the films that they were involved with to classic status. In addition to these individuals, the bands Goblin, Tangerine Dream and Kraftwerk all receive a tip of the hat for their contributions. The whole genre of synthwave could be described as a soundtrack without a film. Almost unanimously, John Carpenter is hailed as a major influence by the majority of featured synthwave artists. The final word comes from John Carpenter, and is a message of hope to all of us bedroom artists and creators to keep going and putting ourselves out there, be it musicians, filmmakers, animators, etc. Remember me. Your art can literally change the world. I'm waiting for it. Love to you all, John Carpenter. The documentary zips by and gives each artist plenty of opportunity to discuss their works, influences and opinion on the genre. It's a wonderful snapshot of how a handful of pioneering artists in the year 2000 would build upon and modernise the sounds of the 80s, using their childhood influences of TV and movies to create a brand of synthesizer music that feels fresh and dynamic whilst paying due reverence to the decade that spawned it. Synthwave peaked into the mainstream with the track Night Call by French artist Kavinsky featuring Love Fox when it featured in the 2011 Ryan Gosling film Drive. How I feel. 
Its influence was heavily felt in the 2019 hit track Blinding Lights by The Weeknd. Synthwave imagery was even used in The Simpsons for one of their couch gags in season 27 back in 2015-16, along with the song Push It to the Limit, produced by Giorgio Moroder. Keep your head or you will finish. Open up the limit. Past the point of no return. This is perhaps the most niche product that I've ever reviewed here on Amazing World of Stuff. But I can't overstate how fantastic I thought this was. I love the synthwave genre. There are certain tracks and songs that have moved me in a way that I haven't felt for years. It's not tainted and sanitised by a cynical record company. This is very much the artist's vision on display and I love it. I've got to know more about bands and artists that I love and learn about new ones that I'm definitely going to check out in the future. I must give a shout out to another synthwave band that I follow who emerged after the creation of this documentary. F. H-E. They've created some fantastic tracks and were kind enough to include some of my contributions in some of their music videos, including... And the writer and director Ivan Castell created a brilliant documentary which sweeps the viewer along by the passion and enthusiasm the artists have for the genre. It explains how a few tracks created by bedroom musicians exploded into a whole movement. The film can be bought or downloaded from the official website. I'll put a link to this in the description. And I highly encourage you to check it out. At some point in the future, I'm probably going to make an episode focusing on some of the albums I have by Synthwave artists, so stay tuned for that. Okay, to answer the question that's been on your lips all of this time, I got these glasses on eBay from Seller Gazelle Fashion at an excellent price. Thanks Giz, these glasses made my vision come true. As always, I genuinely do appreciate you popping by and your support on this channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already and hit the like button. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not go back and check out some of the previous episodes of Amazing World of Stuff. Episode 1 looks at the Garbage Pail Kids series, Revenge of Oh the Horror Ribble, and the horror films that inspired them. Episode 2 checks out a rare UK horror magazine called Terror from 1991, a lovely time capsule of the horror scene in the early 90s. Episode 3 looks at one of my favourite films, the comedy horror musical that is The Phantom of the Paradise. Episode 4 revisits controversial 90s BBC Halloween hoax show Ghostwatch and examines its long-lasting influence. Episode 5 was last year's Christmas special and checks out the rare Kickstarter Christmas album by cult rock band Electric Six. Episode 6 covers a fantastic book about the darker aspects of 70s pop culture, from TV, films, books, games and public service announcements, called Scarred for Life. And Episode 7 covers the original Generation 1 Transformer figure, leader of the Decepticons, Megatron, including his history, controversy and various releases. If that's not enough, then please check out some of my 15 second horror film shorts. There's going to be more coming later on in the year. I should point out that episodes of Amazing World of Stuff may slow down, as I'm animating a 10 minute promo for my friend's books at the moment. Oh, there they are. They're on sale on Amazon now, and they'll probably be covered here in a future episode. 
Thanks again for your company and I'll see you next time. Take care, gang, and stay safe. I have to give a massive shout out to Ogre for the inclusion of the Transformers and Doctor Who Trial of a Time Lord series on his shelf. Truly a man after my own heart.